The following week, when I opened the mesocosm to draw a sample, I saw the carcasses of 12 flying insects. They must have been in nearly microscopic nymph form when I created the microcosm, and when they were ready to emerge, they found the way closed. It is an example of the tremendous biodiversity nature is capable of in such a small space. But when I drew my sample and brought it up to the microscopy lab and placed it on a slide, huge readily visible algae seemed to predominate. But at the microscopic level, I discovered another story entirely. A drop of water placed upon a slide revealed a dark realm like space and particles like stars floating amidst it. And there were various green spheres and colonies of unicellular algae. But there were far more jewel-like diatoms than last time. And I was seeing a wider variety of shapes and amazing colors, such as this one, which I believe to be a cousin to Lycomophora. These organisms, when placed in an enhanced dark field, refracted rainbows of light like microscopic quartz and prisms. And in direct light, the fine and amazing structures of diatoms became apparent, such as this one, which bears an amazing resemblance to Triceratium merlandi, though that appearance could simply be a matter of convergent evolution. It is believed that the many hair-like structures that cover this diatom surface may increase the diatom's ability to catch water, allowing it to be suspended and tossed around more easily by the currents. Of course, diatoms were not the only kind of microscopic algae living in the mesocosm. There were various individual cells and colonies, such as this one, which I believe to be a form of gonium. Illuminated from the side in a semi-dark field, it appears like green gold jewels or insect eggs. But placing a light source directly beneath reveals a translucent nature, a life form filled with food producing chlorophyll and an essential food base of the ecosystem. But for the moment, it's the diatoms that truly fascinate me. The jewel-like cell walls are constructed of silica, a mineral structure very different from the cell walls of plants and animals. In fact, these organisms straddle the boundary between plants and animal, having characteristics of both. For example, some diatoms, as you are about to see, can move about on their own, just like animals, though the method of their mobility is different. Here we see a collection of sand, possibly some hummus from the surrounding forest soil, and the shells of dead diatoms mixed in. It is a rich source of organic matter and looks to be being picked at by yet another diatom that grows in a chain formation. I came across this particularly mobile diatom, swimming like a living jewel in the dark field of the surrounding water. And the behavior psychologist side of myself looks at this organism and thinks, what are its motivations? But I think it's also interesting to look at this organism and consider just how it moves. Unlike microscopic animals and the more animal-like unicellular organisms, it doesn't have cilli or flagella. And looking at it, one could almost assume that it was able to magically glide through this dark field, as if by levitation. Its mobility makes it not unique, but special, I think. Because if you look above and to the right, you can see another diatom, which is not mobile, and some nearby algae, also not mobile. So how does an organism without legs, without cilli, without flagella, accomplish the miracle of movement? The biologist within me certainly wants to know. This is a pinnate diatom, referring to its shape as a form of classification, and certain pinnate diatoms have the ability to secrete a mucilage which draws them over a substrate, in this case, the substrate is the glass microscope slide. And as far as motivations go, well, it is a unicellular organism, so its motivations are inherently going to be simple. Unicellular organisms can remember their activities, if memory is the appropriate word, for about four to eight seconds. And a unicellular organism, well, its goals in life are to eat, grow, and reproduce. I'd say it's a fair guess that in this open area, it is simply looking for food. Though, as it is being exposed to a lot of light right now, it may well be seeking a more sheltered area. Who's to say? What I find psychologically fascinating about studying these tiny organisms is that we undoubtedly find clues to the origins of intelligence as an emergent property. Its simple goals, its simple memory, its extraordinarily simple mind, if we can call it a mind, are based around obtaining food, shelter, suitable habitat, 
and reproductive opportunities. From these basic drives, all this and other microorganisms forms and behaviors are derived. Perhaps here we see the root of intelligence. Maybe if a hundred billion of these diatoms could be multiply networked through dendritic connections with electrochemical synapses in the way that the human brain's neurons manage, we might see all of those various yet simple motivations come together to form something much more complex, much greater than the whole. But that's all speculative. I think at this time, what we can say for sure is these tiny organisms are not only beautiful, but form a key facet of our world, so diminutive that they are invisible and we rarely think of them. But they make up a significant portion of our world's biomass, generate 20 to 50% of our world's oxygen, and are so abundant that when they pass away and their silica shells sink to the bottom of the ocean, they form a layer in some places as much as 800 meters deep and their dry husks are swept up by winds in Africa and carried all the way to the Amazon, where they fertilize the South American rainforest. Pretty amazing for organisms so small that on their own, they cannot even be seen. Next week, we'll take a deeper look at the microscopic life that is more like animals, and yet are so alien to the animals we see with the naked eye, they might as well be from another world, such as this flagellator found swimming around the husks of old diatoms at the bottom of the mesocosm. Thank you for joining on this voyage of discovery into the Micro Story. The Micro Story channel is part of the Understory Network, a series of channels promoting education about natural science and the conservation of the beautiful world that surrounds us. Small but growing channels, they are made possible by our many viewers, patrons, and those persons and businesses that have helped us acquire the resources and equipment necessary to produce high quality programming. If you enjoyed today's program, please take a moment to like and also take a moment to subscribe. It costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps. And keep watch here and on our sister channels for future episodes.